Thank you all for getting here so early this morning. And if it's not obvious, I'm missing. That's Bill. Um, I work in the audio technology department at Columbia University of Technology, uh, background in music production and cognitive science. And a man who needs no introduction. Oh, I don't know about that. I'm going to super briefly introduce myself and talk about myself a little bit more as we go along. But some of you know, uh, I started in 1973 at the Marquee, uh, worked through there until the early 80s. Um, started as a T boy and runner, became engineer, uh, lots of 70s acts that I engineered, including The Clash and Clean Joke, people like that. I'm going faster. Then I left in the uh, early 80s and joined the Autumn and team over at PWL, everything from Rick through to Kylie. Uh, and then I was based at uh, Strongman, that's a picture of Strongman 3, by the way, uh, in the 90s with my partner Ian Kerno, working with lots of boy bands like E17 Boy Zone and got involved in education in the late 90s, and uh, here we are. All right, so structuring the creative process. Humans make a lot of stuff. We make conference dinners, we make alcoholic beverages to go with those conference dinners, we make cars, we make music, and the making process is distinct from the conceiving process, what we do here, uh, though these processes are clearly interrelated. Both making and, perceive, and conceiving are influenced by the maker's understanding of the end product, what we're actually going to produce. Our making isn't random. We create where we imagine possibilities and or see needs to be filled. Take cars, for example. Car designers conceive of all the parts in very minute details. Before any making begins, they mathematically test all these parts for their expected performance and how these different parts are going to function together. Um, then the actual making process conforms to these strict design specifications. But music production is not so predetermined, uh, as I think you've all experienced. There are no design specs, nothing to match up to at the end. What we understand at the start is that there are innumerable possibilities for the completed product, um, even with time constraints or financial constraints, even within a specific genre, the possibilities are many and varied. Producer engineer Hayden Vendell said that a mix is never finished, just abandoned, hopefully at the right point in time. So given all this potential, how do producers take effective decisions? How do producers structure their work, plan, manage, problem solve, to lead a project forward towards something that is unknown at the beginning? So Phil and I have investigated this inherent lack of structure in music production. The decision-making literature outside of music production and, and also the AI literature uh, usually describes this kind of uh, indeterminate scenario as a, an ill-structured problem. These are problems where the solutions cannot be predefined a priori with a set of conditions or criteria or constraints. It's more that we know it's good or good enough when we get to a certain point. But how do we know? How do we trust our decisions and actions as we move through this process? Ill-structured problems are filled with uncertainty, which needs to be managed. We know from studies in non-creative arenas, for example from Jenkins, that when a user is left to cope with complexity, Systems are harder to learn, understand, and use. They're likely to be unintuitive, even for experienced users, and often result in, this often results in a higher workload, reduction in tempo, efficiency, and flexibility, and an increase in potential errors. In many, if not most, music production contexts, we just can't afford this, and it's up to the producer to prevent it. Phil and I set out to uncover concrete things that producers do to make the unknown more knowable and thereby provide reasons for their production decisions. So what conceptual tools do producers use? How is their work organized or how they think of organizing it? And what uncertainty management strategies do they use? So our method. So we started with the assumption that producers are diverse a lot and, and their approaches vary. So we expected to find different strategies for managing uncertainty. And we looked at two producers, Bill being one, and uh, Greg Haver being the other. Greg Haver, you might know his work from Manic Street Preachers. Um, and we conducted semi-structured interviews, so this is kind of an ethnographic approach. Um, now with Phil, obviously this is tricky. Phil helped shape this research question, and we wanted to avoid, to the extent possible, some of the subjective bias of auto-ethnographic uh, approach. 
approaches. So I alone generated question to Phil's interview, um, and he really didn't know uh, at the start how I planned to deconstruct his production process. So he couldn't prepare more than any other uh, informant. And then I analyzed Phil's responses. Following my interview with Phil, together we developed questions for Greg, and then Phil interviewed Greg, we analyzed that data together. And then finally, Phil analyzed two comparable recordings, one that Phil produced and the other that was produced by Greg. So different producers with different approaches, and it's important to note that Phil and Greg have very different musical backgrounds. Also, Phil is renowned for pop music, and he is also renowned for his very systematic approach. Greg is better known for rock and more of a kind of musician to musician and organic approach, which we'll be talking more about. Um, now, we're not claiming that one approach is better than the other, or one approaches uh, decision making in, in a better way. Our goal is merely comparison and to begin to gather the various tools that producers employ to manage uncertainty. And that. Great, thank you, Ms. Um, so, on reflection, going back to the 70s, and this sort of encouraged encouraging me to do this, uh, I realized that in my introdu introduction to the industry, uh, we had very, two very common types of sessions coming into the marquee when I was assistant and engineering. Uh, and a little bit like we've separated myself from Greg, they were pop and rock. So we had pop sessions coming in, with session musicians working to MU rates, three hours, that was 10 to 1. Lunch break, uh, that would be laying down the backing tracks. In the afternoon, it would be overdubs. In the evening, it would be the session singers. And that was very, very... That was a very structured system, as, as we've broken down uh, how I now work and have done since the 90s. Uh, and then by contrast, we had a producer called Gus Studgeon, just so happens we're going to talk about uh, something to do with his foundation later as well. Uh, he produced Self John, and he used to come in and have block bookings. So they weren't three hour blocks of sessions, it was like uh, he'd start at 10 or 11 and go through to be on midnight, and he'd block book for weeks and weeks, you know, working mixed out John, we recorded Kiki D, this kind of thing. So I realized, okay, uh, there were two approaches and they both had systems about them, uh, although I was unaware of it at the time. By the time I got to uh, PW, PW in the 80s, the system became a lot clearer with people to the team leader, as I've already talked about in uh, previous sessions. You want to come in? <laughs> um, and I've talked about that in my service model. Thank you, thank you, Paul. Uh, talked about that in my service model presentations with uh, Paul Thompson, and probably I really honed down that service model system even more in the nineties. I'm still unaware at this point that I was being quite so systematic and working to what I now call a service model. Uh, and uh, so in the nineties. That was P&E based at the strong room, and that was with Ian Kerno. So, uh, so now, uh, through my studies and uh, further reflection, I realised that uh, I'm working with my current uh, pop production team very much to a fairly strict service model and a uh, very systematic approach, as we've said. So, what makes up that team? Uh, all we went through this on Monday with Paul, but just wanted to clarify it, really, that... Um, Needs team leader, I think I clarified Needs two programmers really, a music programmer and a rhythm programmer. Musicians are extra and it needs a top liner. So, so to me the service model for pop music production, four people, two programmers, one team leader, one top liner. Okay. And this leads us to some of the other discoveries that, uh, that I've made throughout my studies. Okay. Simon Skorsky Thomas talks about Sonic cartoons. I've kind of drawn it from that, but I don't really see it like that. My view is that uh, I have a Sonic picture at the start of the project when in pre production, as you'll see from the demonstration I'll show later, uh, I choose a song from an audition based on my instant vision of the song being played to me in the room. And that vision. Uh, that, re that vision really takes me through the process and uh, it's a vision of how the final record is going to sound already at the start point. Now, I, I believe this is how producers need to be, but um, others have other views, but it, it, it's great when we get to Greg, he does have a similar view. 
Uh, so how is it realised? Well, during my recording process, whether it's the project I'm going to play or something I do with PGS Productions, which is generally a bit more poppy, um, it's kind of a 2D vision. You know, while you're doing the recording, you're deciding on the overdubs, it's very much in 2D. And, and I realise now that by the time I get to the mix, it's 3D. And by 3D, I, I very much mean pop the vocal is up front, the main instrument, be it keyboard or guitar, is just behind that. And everything else is a kind of a landscape in 3D behind that. And I, and I visualise that more so during the mix than at the very start of the situation. So how do I put that into practice? Paint by numbers. So I'm visualising a picture of audio. Um, I, must, I must do some kind of visual representation of this at some point. But if, if I were to, you know, I, I'd have drums, bass, these guitar overdubs, these backing vocals, all would all be filling in a paint by numbers picture, but in audio. So filling in those spaces, filling in those gaps, and it comes, comes down to uh, the sonic point of view from, for me, whether it's programmed drums or live drums, uh, I like to be the, I like to imagine being the player, so if I'm panning drums, I've got high up to my left, I'm sitting in the drum stall and I'm going left to right, that immediately gives me in my paint by number picture that if my hi-hat is paying half left, and that's quite heavy on 10k, I will put a programmed or a played shaper on the right to balance it. So I'm looking at balancing the sonic picture uh, with, with this painting, and hopefully uh, getting to the point where uh, a novel idea is coming along. So uh, during the process of paint by numbers, I always leave room for novelty. So this is, sounds like a strict system, but um, if one of the programmers has got an idea of something, and, I, and I'm seeing that it's fitting, you know, I've always got my, I've always got space in my picture, a few gaps that, that, that are there to be filled in, and if it sounds like it's working, I'll go with it. Um, so I, I'm going to elaborate on Phil's um, approach in, in a second, but just to clarify, um, the sonic picture, as Phil described it to me, is less of the, the kind of schema that uh, Sikorsky Thomas describes, and more of a, a template, right? It, it's kind of more of, okay, I have a, a vision for the final product, uh, more like something that uh, Brendan Anthony has been researching recently. Um, and paint by numbers is it probably have all experienced painting you know, like coloring books, right? Again, as Phil has described it to me, it's more this, this kind of outline. The bass goes here, the particular keyboard uh, part goes here, uh, the strings go here, this brass line goes here. So there's, there's actually spaces kind of carved out for him mentally uh, where different musical parts will go. And it's important to keep in mind that paint by numbers, right, there are lines. So we have these sort of, uh, at a certain amount of territory that's blocked out. And as he, as he works with his production team, he's assuming that what that production team contributes will fit in those spaces. And I think that's really uh, crucial to his approach. So uh, a little bit more about this. How can, oh, one last thing, sorry, before I go on. Um, what you, I think something you might not have mentioned too is the importance of reference recordings, you, using reference recordings in um, uh, managing his team. So he'll select reference recordings to inspire them or guide them in creating new parts that fit into these kind of paint by number spaces. So how he chooses those reference recordings and what he chooses to share with the team members is really important. Oh, how do we understand all this? So um, uh, Phil goes to great lengths to manage uncertainty. And his actions uh, revolve around guaranteeing predictability in the outcome, which in business terms is very consistent with providing a service, which is uh, really um, is important in his approach. Accordingly, the structure he superimposes on the production process is geared towards economy and optimization. Uh, Phil economizes globally across all stages of the production, but he optimizes locally with each individual contribution. He optimizes by controlling when creative input enters the system, how much creativity, and what kind. And this, this approach is appropriate for the pop genre, um, but also by constraining how much creativity gets in and where it happens, he can ensure consistency of the mixes it, that his team produces, which again ties back to offering service. 
So we can say Phil has three main tools for regulating the production process. Translating, structuring the generative process, which is his painting by numbers, and the distribution of work among his team members. So translate. Translating is a two-part process. Part one. So there's a negotiation. Uh, the client and the team leader, in this case Phil, come to an agreement about what is required and what will be delivered. And this agreement constrains possibilities for the client. Like the client just can't keep reimagining what the mix can be. They, it's almost contractual. This is what we're going to deliver. So by imposing these constraints, Phil is at least partially defining the characteristics of the final product. It's less of an unknown now. And he's creating some specs, some metrics, which he can use to evaluate the, the work of his team members. Now let's notice that uh, this negotiation and translating generally distinguishes the producer's expertise and decision making from that of other contributors in, in the reporting session. So to translate, cognitively speaking, a team leader must have a theory of the client's mind, to use Baron Cohen's term, and as Dennett explored, an appreciation of their intention. He has to understand what the client wants in order to ultimately translate that. And that brings brings us to the second part of translating, interpreting for the team, which requires the same capacity. Uh, interpreting allows Phil to impose structure on the production process. The team will do their jobs based on the information Phil has chosen to give them about this project. Um, so by controlling the information they have, he controls their individual contributions. Um, and interpretation is a management strategy. To interpret, uh, he must emphasize certain requirements and values in the production over others. And by kind of thinking, thinking through these, uh, these values and requirements, he can then break down the production into specific production tasks. What team members should do what, contribute what to the production. Phil's next tool is how he structures the, the generative process, or the process of creating these individual musical parts. And this is what he calls painting by numbers. So painting by numbers is kind of a schematic canvas that loosely maps out the relationships between these musical parts. Um, and the form of that canvas uh, for each project that he works on, it takes shape by Phil integrating information from the client, his own previous experience, and knowledge of the resources available to him for this particular project. And this frame gives him something relatively stable to think with, as Klein would describe it. And that helps him manage the complexity of the production overall. Um, all the parts and possibilities are, are viewed through this frame, and with this structure in mind, then uh, Phil's attention is freed up to dig into the details of each part without losing sense of the whole. Um, and as a result, the time that he spends on individual parts is then more focused and, and more efficient. Uh, Dougherty has, has observed similar uh, kind of efficiency and focus and attention in non-creative domains. So the parts delimited by paint by numbers let Phil employ his next tool, which is this delegation of work among team members. And he's incredibly strict about and specific about who should supply what. Um, and with these clear instructions then, team members can work very independently. Individuals don't have to think about, oh, how is what I'm doing here ultimately going to integrate into the final mix? They can just leave that to Phil. Phil has a plan. So these productions then are less of a collaboration and more of a semi-synchronized activity, as Watson Monk would call it. And since tasks for each individual are tailored to their specific areas of expertise, they're relatively um, more simple and efficient to perform for those individual experts. So it's all these tools together, the translating, the painting by numbers, and the delegation of work that enable, that encourage the sort of overall economy and optimization in production. Okay, uh, we're almost out of time. I think Julie might be a little bit flexible for us. I'll give you till five to. That's fantastic, thank you very much. Okay, so my interview with Greg, uh, his approach, uh, he takes each <laughs> session differently, unlike myself. Mine are very similar and all playing. Uh, he has a sonic image, as opposed to my sonic picture, so very, very similar. Um, he leans very much towards priority to, to, to the artist. And unlike myself, I engineer myself, I mix myself. He delegates that. He has a mix engineer quite often overseas, sends everything to him, and a mastering engineer, all playing before his sessions. 
And, uh, and one of the incredible things is that uh, he does also use reference recordings, goes through that with the artists beforehand, and he likes in the studio uh, musicians responding with other musicians. So that's, yeah. Um, so when we compare those two, uh, the other thing I should have said about Greg, sorry, is that he actually drums on his sessions as a musician, producer. And uh, to me, it's mind boggling that a producer could be in the studio drumming with the band and controlling the session. I still didn't quite gross how he manages to do that. But anyway, so we've called it uh, this organic, which we're putting to Greg's approach. That's our moniker. He doesn't call it that, but we are calling mine systematic. Uh, I build my mixes around vocals. We've talked about the sonic picture. Um, the references, I'm going to show you a quick one if we've got time. And um, no, yeah, no, don't need all the rest of that. <laughs> so this is this gives you a visualisation of uh, uh, of some of our differences. Um, interestingly, I auditioned the song to choose, which I'm going to play you by by the uh, song he chose by the artist. So we had auditions for these uh, GDF James sessions, which I really talked about and really got time. <laughs> uh, there's our planning of sonic pictures and images and um, he chose local musicians, I brought musicians in. We both did pre-production on day one because we were working with 12 students on these sessions and as I say, he, he does the drums himself. He delegates, I mix myself and he, he delegates. So how are we doing? Have we got a minute to play some audio? One minute. One minute. One minute. That's just That's great. Okay, so uh, these sessions we do every summer as part of the uh, GDF James thing. Uh, GDF is Gus Dudgeon Foundation, it's a charity, and we have 12 James students attending from around different universities, and people like myself and Greg will produce the session. So, uh, super quick, this is Teresa, the girl I chose. And I need some Facebook every night Trying to figure out how to make it right But screams out loud Absolutely, what don't I like about this? She comes in straight away, there's no intro Someone tell me <coughs> She goes into a bridge Which is eight bars long All I've done was make her happy I want to go into the chorus now And she said Every guy was a dickhead too. <laughs> Can't have that. So, no, this is how involved a producer can get. You know, we've got to change the lyrics. And I did all of this in front of the students. Um, I played her and the students. Jess and Jay. Example of a four bar read. That was to persuade Teresa and everyone else. We, you know, we can do a four bar pop bridge, and uh, this is the result after all of that. So, I've added an intro, give DJs time to talk over it. I'm trying to turn it into a commercial project instantly in front of everybody's eyes. But it was faster. That's where her version started, basically. And he's Facebook out loud. bridge. Thank you, Facebook. Do you help? You know what you think later? And we're into our chorus, and I think Julie wants me to stop it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Actually, I'll ask the first question because I, I know what they're going to ask, <laughs> which is sort of the key differences, right? So, what we found with a little perspective is that 
Greg's approach, uh, unlike Phil's, where Phil is controlling what's going in and out very, very carefully and, and when sort of novelty or creativity can happen, rather Greg's approach is to kind of uh, set general conditions where there might be potential. And then he, he trusts that he's going to find, oh, this is something to develop here or something to develop there. So he goes into a production with far more kind of ad hoc approach and, and much less of an idea of, of what the final product is ultimately going to sound like in the end. Um, so they both produce wonderful music and, and get to the end, but notice that there's a very different uh, system of getting them. I have a question. Do you, you'll find me in a second. You know? <laughs> very quickly, please. <laughs> I'm about to just play a snippet of Greg's track. But yeah. yeah. Um, do that. Yes. Yeah, yeah yes. if you're more interested in that question, go on. <laughs> you sure? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Well, fire the question because okay. this one's just done like I'm, I'm being efficient. That one? Yeah. What's your question? The question is you keep saying you have a vision. Well, what yeah. if your vision differs radically from the people who come to record? Actually, oh, what, uh, what if it does? I want to see. Can I, while you're thinking, can I start answering that? Oh, it's an answer is up persuading that they need like to... Like you persuaded me to give you longer. They need to... No, I, I discussed with Teresa, because that's a lot of changes in the song. I, dis yeah. I said to her, you know, for the sake of the students, and hopefully a commercial project product at the end, uh, you know, I'm going to tear your song apart and commercialise it, and are you happy to sit back and just yeah. let it happen rather than... And she was. Yeah. Great student, great example. Uh, but if there, if there was real aggression against something, you should say, I'd still get out in the pre-production, the meetings, and would even Yeah, so you would, yeah, it would be sorted out before you actually got yeah. to that. Yeah. 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 This negotiation part, I think, is really crucial in understanding mm -hmm. Phil's approach, because he is setting constraints, he's making an agreement with the client that th this is what the, we all understand what the final product is going to look like. And I think one thing that's really important about the production team is that it's Phil negotiating with the client, not the entire production team. So the most experienced individual is the negotiator who's able to say, yeah, this is reasonable. This this song could turn into that, where while he has great people on his production team, they don't necessarily bring the same experience about yeah, what's yeah. feasible. Yeah. I think we ought to get on to I'm the just, just a tiny snippet. This is Charlotte's track, produced by Greg Labour. Just to show the difference between the two. It's another female singer songwriter. It's a quite a long intro, if you like mine. Negotiated that with the artist, same as I did, but I think it's a great coincidence that we've both ended up with pop four bar bridges on. The University of Huddersfield, inspiring tomorrow's professionals.